are watching Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Pragya. Today we go to Cuba's National Assembly election first. We look at why Sunday's voter turnout crossed 75% and the significance of the outcome. Next, in Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been forced to delay self-serving legal reforms after massive protests. Israel's IDF also reported fewer reservist soldiers joining for duty as some of them joined the protesters. Elections for 470 seats of the Cuban National Assembly took place on Sunday, 26 March. Commentators in Western countries said Cubans should not go to vote, but people of the island country turned up in large numbers to elect their leaders. Sunday's outcome has critical insights for the country, which is struck by shortages due to a long blockade imposed by the United States. Zoe from People's Dispatch joins us over video conference with more detail. Zoe, thank you very much for joining us on this crucial election. Very curious to know what is the outcome? What was the context of the election? Thanks so much for having me. So yes, this Sunday, the 26th of March, uh, the people of Cuba went to the polls um, to vote for who will be the members of the National Assembly. Um, and once again, as always, democratic processes in um, Cuba are met with a lot of uh, scrutiny um, from outside the island. Um, of course, a lot of times with a lack of understanding of actually how this electoral process functions. And so I think it's really important to understand that uh, the voting that happens on Sunday, wherein the people uh, vote and they confirm their support behind um, different candidates who will serve as members of the National Assembly, is really just one part. Um, the process of actually selecting the candidates um, is a much, maybe more, it's more interesting, actually, part of how the elections happen. So um, the member, the people who are actually end up being the candidates are selected through a very, very intensive process that happens directly at the grassroots. So, um, you know, especially being from the United States, we can look at how um, candidates are selected. It often has to do with money, who is able to get support from corporations and funding, et cetera. Uh, in the Cuban case, the way that people are selected to be candidates uh, is that on the in the municipalities, they have the municipal assembly, um, this, along with the mass organizations in the area, so these are the, the Federation of Women, um, the youth organizations, um, peasant organizations, and, other, and organizations from other sectors get together, and they essentially come up with uh, a list of people who they think, from this district, from this very small area, who they think uh, could be good candidates. They come up with a list, they inform the people um, that they've been selected to be pre-candidates, and from there starts a very, very long process um, that all of the people selected as pre-candidates have to go through involving um, going to different municipal assemblies where all of the people from the community are gathered. They're able to uh, be interviewed. Um, they have to present information about their qualifications. Um, following this, there's an the assembly actually has a vote on who of these people, it might be 100 people and they select nine, who of these people is actually um, do they want to represent? And once the candidates are actually confirmed through this very long grassroots consultation process, um, all of these candidates essentially spend a month going to all the different areas in their municipality, uh, meeting with people, hearing their proposals, um, hearing from them and what they want from the country. And so really actually on the 26th of March, when the people go to the polls and they select yes, I want um, these people to be my representatives in the National Assembly. It actually comes out of a very, very long process of consultation. Um, it's important to point out that um, the people are selected. Um, they may be party members, but it's not the party that actually decides who is selected as a candidate. Again, it's these grassroots, territorial, and sectoral organizations that select people. Uh, many people aren't members of the parties. They're members of the community um, that have been highlighted um, as people who are able to represent their voice and actually do the work of carrying out this legislation. And uh, once people are in the National Assembly, they don't receive an extra salary. They actually have to continue doing their daily jobs and the, and the labor they're doing in the National Assembly is sort of a voluntary uh, militant work that they're doing. So I think when we're talking about these elections, it's so crucial to have this context because if you do a side-by-side -side comparison just of the election day, um, you can make a lot of different um, accusations about this process, 
Um, but it, when we look at it as sort of a longer um, process that involves a lot of grassroots consultation, I think it it really represents an interesting model of democracy and uh, can actually teach us a lot about what it means to have people's participation in such a process like this. Right, Zoe, uh, cross-section people get to decide who will lead them, right? Uh, Zoe, what does this result actually tell us about Cuba, about its economy, about the kind of country it is? Well, I think it's interesting because, of course, Cuba is going through one of the worst crises that's had in recent history. Some even say it might be worse than the special period. And this is, of course, due to the fact that under the administration of Donald Trump, an additional 243 sanctions were uh, leveled against the island, in addition to it be adding to the state sponsors of terrorism list, um, an inclusion which essentially makes it very, very, very difficult for Cuba to do normal financial transactions, um, which further stigmatizes it um, in the global community. Despite this, of course, it continues to have very, very important um, relationships with uh, countries in the region and, of course, internationally. Um, but that's to say that the economy of Cuba at this moment is extremely fragile. It is an extremely difficult um, position. Um, and of course, this has brought a lot of social tensions to the fore because the country is unable to meet all of the material needs of its people, which it has um, throughout its history as the, as the Cuban revolution. Um, but that being said, I think there was some, some fear about how this would uh, affect, for example, electoral participation. Um, but actually the participation was several points higher than it was in the latest elections and municipal elections that took place in last November. Um, this time about 75% of the electorate participated in these elections. Um, six Over 6 million people of the 8 million who are ele eligible to vote. So I think that's really important. Points out that there is still a lot of faith, a lot of trust in the system People want to participate in um, in this uh, democratic process. Um, so I think that's a really important kind of vote of confidence as the country is really struggling together to overcome this moment of deep um, difficulty. Uh, so, you know, in this vote, um, the majority of the people who voted did vote for all of the candidates, which is um, a, a proposal that was brought up by Fidel uh, during the special period, actually, that saying voting for everyone gives a vote of confidence to the revolution and saying that you support this project. So I think the fact that both there were 75 percent of people that went out to vote and that most of them actually of 72 percent of them voted for all of the candidates is showing that um, there's a lot of support behind the process, that people want to continue forward with the revolution, and also that they have a lot of proposals for how to make uh, for how to continue going forward. And one of them is, of course, continuing to mobilize against the blockade and calling for an end to all of these different measures that were brought in during the Trump presidency. There continues to be um, demands to the Biden administration that actually make good on its demands to reverse um, these Trump era policies. And that continues to be on the table. Right, Zoe. Thanks a lot for joining us with that update. Thanks so much for having me. After Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu delayed his legal bid to govern the judiciary, Israeli protesters declared they will keep protesting until it is withdrawn. Recently, Israel's Defense Minister Yoav Gallant was sacked for saying the reform should stop. Of course, the so-called reform is part of Netanyahu's self-serving bid to deal with the legal cases against him. But did the Israeli Defense Forces reporting that a percentage of reservist soldiers did not turn up for duty play a role? Prabhi Purkasa joins us in the studio with details of Israel's ongoing crisis. Prabhi, can you give us a context and background of these protests and how they unfolded in Israel, why they matter? Well, of course, the protests have been unfolding for some time, but clearly reached a flashpoint as of the last three days, yes. and particularly after their uh, defense minister had to be sacked because he said we should at least call a halt time being, for the time yes. being, of going ahead with this uh, so-called judicial reforms, which was really to disempower the Supreme Court and put all the control of even the laws into the hands of the government, the ruling government. And at the point, the ruling coalition is really being driven by an agenda of the extreme right. And that extreme right wants large-scale 
further changes by which the Palestinian population there, the original population of this place, of the what used to be originally Palestine, right. now Israel and Palestine, the original population who still are there in Israel, they should be completely marginalized, if not sent into refuge. Where? We don't know. In fact, that is the uh, demand of the right wing that essentially will cleanse Palestine, uh, the, uh, cleanse larger, greater Israel right. of all Palestinians. And the finance minister has said there are no Palestinians in any case. So this has been the larger uh, agenda of the extreme right in Israel. The question, of course, is that why has the extreme right, which was never a part of any government, has become a part of government today? And for that, we have to see what was Netanyahu's issue. That Netanyahu, if he does not become the prime minister, he will go to jail because he's already been convicted of bribes and so on. And if the conviction uh, stands, which it is at the moment, then he will not... The, in fact, he has to go to prison. Right. And he also loses his prime ministership. Is only one part. He loses his also his seat. So given all of this, he has a huge stake. But I think the proximate issue, why we have they have landed in the crisis that they have and why they have taken back the measures, at least called a 30-day halt of this, is because the army reservists also started participating in the in the protests, and they said, we'll not turn up for a reserve duty. And one part of the Israeli military, which people may not realize, that it is still a quote-unquote volunteer army, in the right. sense they have compulsory duty, they have to join, but at the same time, after that, they act as reservists. A certain section agrees to be reservists, and if they are reservists, then they go to the army or the air force once a week to get them abreast of what is happening, retain their practice, arms, flying, all of that, so that they actually maintain their military skills, so to say. And that's more than half their army, half their air force. So if okay. they don't turn up, if they don't turn up for reserve duty, and if they say we'll not, uh, we don't agree to be reservists anymore, they have a huge crisis. And Israel's whole argument of being the genre arm, genre arm of the West, so to say, mm -hmm. the strong arm of the West right. in this region, then falls into question. And if the Air Force, only half the Air Force is available because the reservists are not there, then vis-a-vis -vis Iran, they are, at a, they are going to be at a loss. So given all of this, the army crisis or the crisis of the armed forces and is the, is the proximate cause, which is why the Defense Minister Galant, who comes from the same arm, same party as uh, uh, Netanyahu yeah. does, same party as the Justice Minister does, they're all a member of the same party. Galant said, this has to stop, we have to call a halt to this because I, he was really worried. Then therefore the Defense Forces would then start Show, not showing up for duty, meaning the reservists, and they have a huge military crisis on their hands. So this is the proximate cause of why they have called a halt, but it doesn't mean that the crisis goes away. Will it continue to snowball? Will they take a back seat? That means the, they will get a breathing space? That is something we have to see. Too early to call at this point. Does it depend on what the government de does next? Because they've said that they're putting the law on hold. They're not saying you're taking it away. So what happens next? You see, there are two possibilities that existed. The option they chose is to call a halt for 30 days. Yes. But the president of Israel had put a proposal by which he said you can negotiate between all the political parties what is the settlement on this issue. Okay. Now, that is something which was not acceptable for by the, uh, the extreme right, which, is, which has about 14 seats in the parliament, and with whose support... Netanyahu has got 64 seats. He needs 61 to have a majority. So there are really four, four members in the switch that this government is gone. Right. So the question is, therefore, he cannot annoy the, the extreme right who is a partner in this government. They're never partner of any previous government. This is the first one from what I can remember. 
at least in my memory, that they're part of the government. Otherwise, they were considered as real extreme right, something which even the right-wing other parties would not touch. They were considered so far out of, uh, out of uh, normal politics, so to say. And these are also people, by the way, most of whom don't join military service. Okay. Because they said they have some religious objections right. and therefore they take an exemption. Otherwise, it's compulsory military service, as you know, in Israel. But they have been sort of let off military service. Netanyahu is not in a position to say, OK, I'll give up my government and we will try some other option. Sure. But let me get out of this because this is not going to fly. Now, that he's not able to do because he's stuck because of his uh, being possible disqualification and the uh, case, the verdict that is there. So he needs to be prime minister to protect himself from this legally. Therefore, he is willing to sacrifice the stability of the country to provide stability for himself. This is the charge against him. So if the way forward was to be negotiations, then the negotiations would have been done by the president, whatever he put forward could have been a place where both of them could have come and discussed. I think the opposition was more or less willing to do this. But the fact is Netanyahu is not willing to do this. So putting the 30-day hold right. still means the, the bill that is there is in parliament. Mm -hmm. And if the bill is there, then he can get it passed in one day. So therefore, it is a kind of a loaded gun that stays still. Uh, primed and therefore ready to fire at any moment. So that is one. The other part of it, which has not come in public sphere so much, is why did the labor unions go on strike? They actually That's right. paid every, put everything to a standstill. The airports were not functioning, the buses were not running, so transport was not available. So they really did a complete strike in uh, uh, Israel after this sort of came to a head-on collision, so to say, and the protests spread. Because there is also an anti-labor legislation which these people want to push through, which is labor rights. Okay. And therefore, right to strike being taken away. These are the, some of the threats that seem to be there. So that's why this labor law is another part, not this bill, but the labor law is another part which is on the, in the, on the table so to say, and that's why the workers have gone on strike and really paralyzed Israel. We must also understand there are other issues also which are sort of making it much more difficult for Netanyahu. The point is, look at the statements coming. There is a finance yes. minister who says we should obliterate Huara, right. a township which the Israeli right wing has attacked repeatedly after somebody from there went and shot some some of the Jewish population, I think five or six people were killed or seven people were killed. After that, they have had series of progroms, so to say, attack the place, flattened houses, uh, kill a couple of people, beat up rest. This has been continuing. And the argument that Huara should be flattened, right. completely bulldozed, as it were, that is also something which the finance minister of Israel, who belongs to the extreme right, has said. So it's also clear the way these things are developing in Israel, the collision between what is seen to be, at least in their terms, centrist forces against those who are on the right. This is the clash coming up. This is only intensifying. And it's also true that with this religious, extreme religious right, as it were, there is also true that they don't have too much sympathies among the population. They never win too many seats right. anyway. It's a coalition of them. They got 14 seats. As you know, it's not the first passport system in Israel. Right. So they get percentage of votes wise, they get a number of seats. But the problem that they have had is they don't have large scale support. This is the reason that Netanyahu's party is a critical element of their trying to change the laws of the country. And because of the weakness of Netanyahu, therefore, he has conceded far more mm -hmm. than perhaps he needed to do. Right. The reason for these concessions are he needs to be the prime minister. In any other coalition, it, the demand would be, why him? Why not somebody else? 
and they could have another coalition quite easily as they have had in the past. Naftali Bennett and he right. could actually have a coalition also. So there are other options, but all those options are precluded if Netanyahu is not the prime minister. So that is also a major element in all this. So I think what you are seeing as fractures of a kind in Israeli society, which have not opened up before, and not this, this intensity. And this is almost, for the rest of the world, it's almost a sudden crisis. Right. It, it is not an issue which should have been an existential issue for Israel. That means, why did they need to uh, take away the powers of the judiciary and give it ex ex almost exclusively to the government? There is no particular need for it, except, except. for the fact that they want to, extreme right wing here wants to create a different Israel, not even the Israel which is virtually disenfranchised in various ways, the Palestinian population, but a different agenda of driving them out altogether, taking over East Bank, all of that. So whatever uh, the Israel, pa Palestine is there, that is also be, is to be dismantled and actually try and send the population, the Palestinian population out of Israel and say this is now only a Jewish land, which is what the extreme right has always been arguing for. I think that is something which will not be acceptable even to the, uh, shall we say, the Jewish population in Israel and certainly it saps completely their international support base on which they really depend, including the Americans. So I think we are reaching a crisis, a flashpoint can Netanyahu pull back from that? Can he survive without the extreme right? Will the extreme right change? And will he be able to calm down the anger of the people with this 30-day uh, interregnum that he has sought? Right. Are questions to be seen? I don't think this is going to really end with a pause of this kind. I think he will have to concede more if he wants people to go back. But again, these are questions which have to be answered in Israel at the moment. And it's really various you know, sections of the Jewish population who are fighting at the moment. The Palestinians have been marginalized, even the what they call Arab-Israeli population. Right. That has also been marginalized. This is a play which in, in which they, are not, they do not figure. But it is also about them. And it's also about the future of Israel and Palestine. Uh, which the East Bank, as it were, and about the uh, Gaza Strip. So all of this is we have to watch what happens. And don't forget, Israel is a major player in West Asia. So what happens in Israel is also going to set the tone of what's going to happen in other parts of West Asia. In any case, I think the, the strength of Israel as a regional player has weakened considerably with the Iran-Saudi agreement right. and therefore a possible settlement in Syria which will see Israel more isolated than before. We have to see how this plays out. Right, Prabir, thanks very much for joining us with that. And that is all we have for you today. Thank you for watching Daily Debrief. Do come back to us tomorrow. You can visit our website for more People's Dispatch stories and watch our regular updates on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram.